Greetings to all. Welcome to Future of Business Academy. Today we are going to just see daily current affairs of June 13 to 19. Today we are going to discuss the topic of ozone depleting substance, mitigation work program, global gender gap report, Matsya 6000, Montreal Protocol, Dead Zone, Global Environment Facility, Great Scheme, Krishi Shakti Convergence Program, Cyberspace Operations and Angel Tax. These are the topics we are going to discuss under this video. Our first topic is ozone depleting substance. Now we have to know about what is ozone depleting substance. It is the chemicals that cause the depletion of strato stratospheric ozone layer the layer is crucial for protecting life on earth by absorbing the majority of the sun's harmful ultraviolet that is uv radiation the most common ozone depleting substance includes chlorofluorocarbons that is cf Cs. Next, halons. Next, carbon tetrachloride. Next, methyl chloroform. So these are the some of the most common ODS. These substances commonly used in refrigerators, air conditioners fire extinguisher and aerosols with this we have to know about the montreal protocol in back we'll have detailed analysis of this now we'll have brush up of this the montreal protocol signed in 1987 it is the global agreement to protect the stratospheric ozone layer by eliminating the production and consumption of ods like chlorofluorocarbons the worldwide production of cfc has been prohibited since 2010 with this, we have to know at Kigali Amendment to Pro Mon Montreal Protocol. In 2016, parties to the Montreal Protocol adopted the Kigali Amendment to phase down the production and consumption of hydrofluorocarbons worldwide. Here, HCFCs are widely used alternatives to ODS such as hydrofluorocarbons and chlorofluorocarbons, which is already controlled under this protocol. So, that's all from this topic. Our next topic is about Mitigation Work Program The Mitigation Work Program that is MWP is the process established by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that is UNFCCC to help the countries scalp up their mitigation ambition and implementation to achieve the 1.5 degree Celsius goal of the Paris agreement now what are the objectives of this mwp is first generate discussions next is inclusive participation third explore opportunities fourth operationalization fifth address equity and sustainable development so these are the some of the objectives of mitigation work program under the generative discussions it says about the innovative discussion among policymakers and stakeholders to overcome barriers to scaling of the mitigation action in inclusive participation it says that to ensure diverse participation to support national process and practical domestic policy making pathways in third explore opportunities it says about identify cost effective and scalable mitigation opportunities to help countries implement and enhance their national determined contribution so in these two it seems as a 
about the same thing. Now with this we have to know about UNFCCC. It is established in the year 1992 during the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. It aims to establish greenhouse gas concentrations to prevent dangerous climate change, ensuring ecosystems adapt naturally and sustainable development is maintained. Our next topic is global gender gap. It is an annual index designed to measure the gender equality. It benchmarks gender-based gaps in four areas in economic first in it constraints in four areas. First one is economic participation. Next, sorry, first one is economic participation and opportunity. The second one is educational attainment. Third, health and survival. Fourth, political empowerment. So, it was released by World Economic Forum. That is W. E F. It is the longest standing in this tracking the progress of numerous countries' efforts towards closing these gaps over time since inception in 2006. Now we have some highlights of 2024 report. The global gender gap score in 2024 for all 146 countries stands at 68.5 percentage at 0.1 percentage point improvement on last year. At the current pace, it will take another 134 years to achieve full gender parity. India slipped two places to 129th place as Iceland retained its top position in the rankings for the 15th consecutive year. It was followed in the top 10 by Finland, Norway, New Zealand, Sweden, Nicaragua, Germany, Namibia, Ireland and Spain. With the population of over 1.4 billion, India closed 64.1 percentage of its gender gap in 2024. In South Asia, India was ranked fifth after Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan, while Pakistan was ranked last in the world. Sudan was ranked last on the index of 146 countries, while Pakistan fell three places to 145th. India was among the economies with the lowest level of economic party with Bangladesh, Sudan, Iran, Pakistan and Morocco as all of them register less than 30% gender parity is estimated on income. India showed the best gender parity in terms of enrollment in secondary education and ranked 65th globally on political empowerment for women. With this regard to parity in number of years with female male heads of state for the last 50 years India ranked 10th. So that's all from the topic of global gender gap. Our next topic is about Matsya 6000. Here the Matsya 6000 is a three person three person submersible so that will able to go 6000 meters under the sea. This vessel is being developed by Chennai's National Institute of Ocean Technology. It has been structured made up of 80 mm thick titanium alloy. It will be able to withstand a pressure 600 times greater than that of sea level. The Matsya 6000 will be able to operate from 12 to 16 hours of strait and will have an oxygen supply of 96 hours. Now with this we have to know about the National Institute of Ocean Technology. It was established in the year November 1993 as the Autonomous Society under the Ministry of Earth Science. Its objective is to develop 
reliable indigenous technologies to solve the various engineering problems associated with the harvesting of non-living and living resources in India exclusive economic zone which is about two-thirds of land area of India. Now we have to know about deep sea mission. The deep ocean mission that is deep ocean mission nothing but as DOM is an ambitious initiative to explore and harness the depths of the ocean. It is the five-year mission approved by the Union Cabinet in 2021 with a budget of nearly 4,077 crore. The mission aims to develop technologies for deep sea mining, manned submersibles and underwater robotics as well as for ocean climate change advisory services, deep ocean survey and exploration. So that's all from this topic. Our next topic is about Montreal Protocol. The Montreal Protocol and substance that deplete the ozone layer is a landmark multilateral environment agreement that regulates the production and consumption of nearly 100 man-made chemicals referred to as ozone depleting substance. So these substances that are commonly used in products such as refrigerators, air conditioners, fire extinguishers and aerosols which we saw earlier in our first topic such things. So when re released into the atmosphere those chemicals damage the stratospheric ozone layer earth's protective shield that protects humans and the environment from the harmful levels of ultraviolet radiation from the sun. The Montreal Protocol sits under the Vienna Convention. For the protection of ozone layer. It was adopted on 16th September 1987. The protocol is to date one of the rare treaties to achieve universal ratification. This protocol phrases the conception and production of different ODS in a stepwise manner with different timetables for development and developing countries. Under this treaty, all parties have specific responsibilities which have been related to phase out the different groups of ODS, control the ODS trade, annual reporting of data, national licensing systems to control ODS, import and export and also the other matters. Developing and developed countries have equal but different responsibilities but most importantly both groups of countries have binding time targeted and measurable commitments. The meeting of the parties is the governance body for the treaty with technical support provided by the open ender working group both of which meet an annual basis. So next we have to know about Kaigali amendment in 20 2016, parties to the Montreal Protocol adopted in Kaigali Amendment to fix down production and consumption of hydrofluorocarbons in worldwide. The hydrofluorocarbons in worldwide use alternative ODS such as hydrochlorofluorocarbons and chlorofluorocarbons, which are already controlled under this protocol. The HCFCs are powerful greenhouse gases and global implementation of Kaigali Amendment. It expected to avoid up to half a degree Celsius of temperature rise. It will phase down HFC consumption and production based on the carbon dioxide equivalent that is CO2 E by 85% by 2045. So that's all from the Montreal Protocol topic. Our next topic is about dead zone. Here the term dead zone or hypoxia refers to the low oxygen areas in the world's lakes and oceans. Because here most of the organisms need oxygen to live. Few organisms can survive in hypoxic conditions. That is why these areas are called as dead zones. This hypoxic zones can occur naturally but human activities can also lead to the creation of new dead zones or the enhancement of existing ones. How are the dead zones formed here? A dead zone occurs as a result of eutrophication. So which happens when a body of water is indurated with too many nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen. At normal levels and Organisms called cyanobacteria or blue-green algae feeds on these nutrients. With too many nutrients, it can cause overgrowth of algae in a short period of time, also called as algae blooms. 
dead zones from when algae die sink to the bottom and are decomposed by bacteria a process that stripes dissolved oxygen from the surrounding water dense algal blooms also block sunlight which prevents underwater grasses from growing in turn the animals that depend on these grasses for food and shelter suffer as well humans activities mainly cause these excess nutrients to be washed into the ocean which is why dead zones are often located near inhabitable coastlines once a dead zone forms other factors can influence its size and duration for example wind can mix with oxygen from the surface into deeper water and help break dead zones hot temperatures can make dead zones worse by warming a layer of surface water that locks colder denser water below where oxygen from the surface can't mix in heavy rainfall increases the amount of pollution washed into waterways also the shallow waters are less likely to stratify than deep waters and so are less likely to develop hypoxic conditions this is because shallow waters tends to be well mixed by winds and tides with this waters that are shallow and clear enough to allow life to reach the bottom can support primary producers such as phytoplankton algae and sea grasses that releases oxygen during photosynthesis so that's all from the topic of dead zone our next topic is global environment facility it was established on the eve of 1992 rio earth summit of un fcc to help tackle a planet's most pressing environmental problems it is a family of funds dedicated to confronting biodiversity loss climate change pollution and strains on the land and ocean health it provides financial assistance for five major international environmental conventions such as minamata convention which is on mercury next stockholm convention which is on pops that is persistent organic pollutants third United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity that is UNCBD United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity next UNCCD that is United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification next is UNFCC United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change it has totally 184 member countries including india the governing council of its main governing body of this global environment facility is comprises of 32 members appointed by constituents is of this global environmental facility member countries with 16 from developing countries 14 from developed countries and two from economics in transition its secretariat is based on washington the gef trust fund was established to help tackle our planet's most pressing environmental problems funds are available to developing countries and countries with economies in transition to meet the objectives of the international environmental conventions and agreements that's all from this topic our next topic is about great scheme the great scheme that is a um, grant for research and entrepreneurship across aspiring innovation in technical textiles so this is stands for great which encourages young innovators scientists or technologists and startup ventures in the field of technical textiles to translate their ideas into commercial technology products and make india as a self reliant one it supports individual entrepreneurs and startups for functional prototypes or commercialization of their technologies for textile textile next the funding a grant in aid up 
to rupees 50 lakh for up to period of 18 months will be provided for them now what are the key factors for this national technical textiles mission it was launched to increase penetration level of technical textiles in the india while leveraging the extraordinary growth rate of this sector this mission aims to position india as the global leader in technical textiles now what are the components of this the first component is research innovation and development next promotion and market development third is export promotion and finally it says about the education training skill development in this field the nodal ministry here is ministry of textiles the time period for this is it has been approved within the implementation period of four years starting from 2020 financial year to 2021 also till 2023 to 2024 financial year so that's all from this great scheme our next topic is about krishi shakti convergence program in this it aims to transform rural india to empowerment of rural women as krishi shakti by imparting training and certification of krishi shaktis as para extension workers this certification course also aligns with the objective of Lakpati Didi program. Krishi Shaktis have already been trained on various extension services such as in agroecological practice, organizing farmer field school, seed banks, soil health and conservation, integrated farming systems, livestock management, bio input also in communication skills. These Krishi Shakti are undergoing refresher training with a special focus on natural farming and soil health card through day NRLM agencies in the coordination with the managed Krishi Shakti training program has been rolled out in 12 states such as in Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Odisha, Jharkhand, Andhra Pradesh and Meghalaya. These states have been covered in the phase one. So that's all from this topic. Our next topic is about cyberspace operations. Here, India's first joint doctrine for cyberspace operations have been seen. Now we have to know about what is cyber warfare. The cyber warfare are the actions taken in a cyberspace, which is in dynamic and virtual space that connects the different computer systems by state or non-state actors that either constitute a serious threat to a nation's security or connected in response to preserve threat against the nation's security. Unlike territorial limits in the traditional domains of warfare such as land, sea and air, cyberspace is a global common and hence it has shared sovereignty. Hostile actions in cyberspace can impact the nation's economy, cohesion, political decision making and the ability to defend itself. Now what are the types of cyber welfare? We have different types they are cyber terrorism next cyber fraud third cyber spying and fourth cyber stalking or bullying now we have to know about how india is vulnerable to this cyber attacks the cyber security threats emanate from a wide variety of sources and manifest themselves in destructive activities that target individuals business nationals infrastructure and governments alike in 2023 india recorded 2138 weekly cyber attacks per organization a 50 percentage increase from 2022 this makes India the most targeted nation in the Asian Pacific region after Taiwan. So we have to know about the cyber security challenges too. Lack of adequate human resources, infrastructure, R&D and budgetary allocations to tackle the cyber threats are also seen. Threat emerging from servers hosted outside the India. Also challenges posted by imported electronics and IT products by upcoming technologies through as cloud computing, big data, internet things are also a cyber security challenges balance between cyber security and right to privacy also being a big challenge for this now what are the measures taken by the indian government to overcome this india took various measures such as 
the Indian computer emergency response team that is C E R T N. Next is cyber surakshit bharat third cyber swachhta kendra fourth national cyber security policy 2013 fifth ncii pc next <coughs> indian cyber crime coordination center so these are the some of the measures taken by the Indian government. The India's first joint doctrine for cyberspace operation is here. The China has built major capabilities in the cyber warfare domain, including cyber weapons, to degrade or destroy an adversary's military assets and strategic networks. India has been lagging far behind in the arena, with the government only approving the creation of only a small tri-service defense cyber agency in. 2019 instead of full fledged cyber command that arm forces wanted now what are the significance of this doctrine the dust doctrine lays emphasis on understanding military aspects of cyberspace operations also it provides conceptual guidance to commanders staff practitioners in the planning and conduct of operations in cyberspace also raises awareness of the indian war fighters at all levels so that's all from the cyberspace operation topic our next topic is about angel tax the angel tax is a term basically used to refer to the income tax payable on the capital raised by unlisted companies through the issues of shares through off market transactions this tax is levied on the capital raised via the issues of shares by unlisted companies from the indian investor if the share price of issued shares is seen in excess of the fair market value of the company the excess realization of considered as income and therefore taxed accordingly if the fair market value of the startup share is rupees 10 rupees and in a subsequent funding round they offer it to an investor for rupees 20 then the difference of rupees 10 would be taxed as an income angel tax gets its name from the wealthy individuals that is angels who invest heavily in risky unproven business ventures and startups in the initial stages when they are yet to be recognized widely so with this we have to know about budget 2023 to 24 of and the angel tax the investments that are used to fall under the ambit of angel tax before the introduction of budget 2023 to 24 as was imposed only on investments made by the resident investors it was not applicable in case the investment or made by any non resident or venture capital funds Along the concerns of startup community, the government had also exempted investments made by the domestic investors in the companies approved by an inter-ministerial panel from angel tax. So that's all from the topic of angel tax. To get this document to read, you can visit our website. Our website link have been provided in the description. To get more daily current affairs videos, follow our YouTube channel also our Telegram channel. Thank you.